Thank you, Einstein. Thank you and uh, all the core developers of uh, MATLAB Reservoir Simulation Toolbox uh, for organizing this event and more importantly, uh, developing uh, such a wonderful toolbox for the people who are interested in reservoir simulation and modeling different processes in porous media. My name is Sajid Mosley. I am a Master of Science student of Reservoir Engineering at the Petroleum University of Technology. I've been working on um, actually uh, MRST and reactive transport modeling for about a year or so. And I recently developed a module, uh, a non isothermal reactive transport module in uh, MRST uh, called uh, PENTREACT, uh, which stands for Pressure Energy Transport Reaction. And as the name suggests, it is capable of modeling um, actually. Um, you know, fluid flow, uh, energy or heat transfer and reactive transport in porous media. Actually, I uh, developed this module as part of my Master of Science thesis, which is about the investigation of the uh, ceiling capacity of the cap rock of geothermal reservoirs using MRST. So let me let me give you an outline of what I'm going to talk about. First of all, I'll talk about I'll give you an introduction to reactive transfer modeling. Then I'll talk about the development of a reactive transport code in MRST Pent React, uh, which includes uh, talking about governing equations, the auxiliary equations used, and the solution approach. And uh, after that, I'll verify the code. Uh, and I'll also um, demonstrate the applicability of Pent React uh, uh, you know, by investigating the ceiling capacity of a fractured cap rock for CO2 disposal using two different fracture models. The first fracture model is a discrete fracture matrix model or DFM. And the second one is the embedded discrete fracture matrix model or EDFM. And, at, uh, and after that, I'll compare uh, the results or actually the computational performance of uh, the geochemistry module uh, with a Pent React module. And at, at the end, I'll talk about my future work. All right. Um, you know, when it comes to uh, reservoir simulation, people usually, you know, think of um, actually fluid flow or heat transfer. Uh, but you know, most of the times, when um, you know, in reservoir engineering, for example, when uh, inject CO2 uh, into an aquifer, um, you know, a, a range of chemical reactions may occur. For example, the solution precipitation reactions. When we inject um, you know, hydrogen into um, you know an underground reservoir. Hydrogen uh, dioxide may be produced, uh, which is very important to us as uh, a toxic gas. So, in order to, for example, monitor how much uh, hydrogen dioxide is going to be produced, uh, or what parameters are going to affect uh, how much hydrogen dioxide is going to be produced, uh, we need to model reactive transport to investigate the chemical reactions that are uh, that are going to occur. All right, so I developed a module in uh, MRST called Pent React. Um, let's talk about the governing equations that are used. Uh, at first, we have uh, the pressure equation, which is actually the mass conservation equation of the dominant species that we have. Um, in this case, I assume that we're injecting, uh, for example, CO2, an aquifer, and CO2 is completely dissolved in water, and the acidified water moves toward uh, the cap rock and is going to you know, dissolve it. It is, is going to uh, you know, trigger a range of chemical reactions in cap rock. So in this case, uh, the dominant species is water, and the minor species are um, you know, the chemical sp species like calcium, magnesium, carbonate, you know, these um, minor species are not going to affect the flow very much. So I have not considered their uh, actually presence uh, in this um, you know, equation because their effect is quite negligible. And actually this equation calculates the pressure distribution in the reservoir, and that's why I called it the pressure equation. Some researchers call it the flow equation, but I prefer to use this term. After that, we have the energy conservation equation, which is this. Uh, in the case of isothermal systems, uh, this energy cons uh, conservation equation is not used. 
And for mass transport equations, we have actually the mass conservation equations of primary species and their corresponding secondary species. Of course, I'm not going to uh, get into the details because um, you know we're running out of time and you can uh, get more information by uh, reading the literature about reactive transport modeling. And for modeling chemical reactions, uh, we have two types of uh, reactions uh, in reactive transport modeling. Equilibrium reactions and kinetic reactions. Th this module is capable of distinguishing these reactions from each other. In order to you know, model equilibrium reactions, I have used the mass action law, uh, which is this, the equilibrium constant and the reaction quotient. And for modeling uh, actually uh, kinetic rate constants, I have used this relation. Uh, and this is uh, the uh, actually reaction rate, which is calculated by this relation. This is the kinetic rate constant, reactive surface area of that mineral, the reaction quotient, which is uh, the same as this one, and the equilibrium constant. All right. So uh, there are some auxiliary equations that uh, are used uh, in the code uh, for updating the fluid density when pressure changes. For isothermal systems, this relation is used. When the system is non-isothermal, um, uh, this correlation is used, which is uh, in the geothermal module, and it is a function of pressure and temperature. For updating uh, fluid viscosity for isothermal systems, because the, pre and the effect of pressure on viscosity is negligible or very small, I um, you know, considered that there's no change, but non-isothermal systems, this correlation is used that is in the geothermal module as a function of pressure and temperature. For updating the amount of porosity values, uh, this, this relation is used uh, in order to uh, actually uh, consider the effect of pressure on porosity. And um, when the solution and precipitation occurs, porosity changes. This relation is used in order to update the porosity value. So when porosity changes, permeability changes as well, which is actually um, you know, the important parameter uh, for, uh, to a reservoir engineer. So we used the kosnik karman relation for matrix grid blocks to update um, actually permeability and modified kosnik karman relation for fracture grid blocks to um, you know, update the permeability of those grid blocks in the fracture. So when the solution and precipitation occurs, uh, reactive surface area of the mineral changes, I use this relation in order to update the value. And for non-isothermal systems, uh, when temperature changes, um, actually equilibrium uh, constants and kinetic rate constants change as well. I use the Van Hoff equation to update the value of equilibrium constant and the Arrhenius equation to update the value of kinetic rate constant. All right. So now let's talk about uh, how these you know, equations are solved. I actually used um, you know, the fully implicit scheme. Of course, some researchers might confuse it with uh, the global implicit approach, which is in the reactive transport modeling. What I mean by a fully implicit scheme is that uh, as much as possible, all the parameters uh, are actually uh, solved in the next time step, which uh, actually is unknown. So the number of um, you know, unknowns is large. All right. Uh, so uh, and the system is very nonlinear. So we have to use, um, for example, the newton raphson method in order to solve the system. All right. And we, in order to solve, um, actually use the newton raphson method, uh, we need to differentiate the equations. So now MRST you know, shows itself and we can use uh, the automatic differentiation to easily uh, differentiate uh, the equations that we have. And uh, actually uh, the approach that I used to um, actually solve the reactive transport model is the sequential iterative approach. In the sequential iterative approach, the governing equations are divided into two or three sub problems. The first sub problem uh, solves the pressure and energy equations. The second sub problem solves the mass transport equations and the third sub problem solves the reaction relations. And because the approach is iterative after um, you know, one time of solving the whole system, uh, it will be solved um, you know, all over from the beginning again after 
um, a certain uh, criterion is uh, actually satisfied for convergence. And for non-isothermal systems, um, you know, the energy equation is here, but if the system is non-isothermal, if the system is isothermal, this energy equation is removed. And for non-isothermal systems, the approach is like the one in Tough React. So we ver verified the code by uh, considering a one-dimensional model. We injected uh, acidified water into the leftmost grid block and um, you know produced it you know with a constant pressure um, you know from uh, the rightmost grid block uh, and uh, you see you know the profiles here this is the dolomite concentration uh, which has gone under uh, the solution here and this is the distribution of hydrogen concentration in the model which you, i compared the results with cmg gem and these are um, you know uh, you know the comparison of them all right so let me give you and uh, actually uh, demonstrate the applicability of Pentreact to investigate the ceiling capacity of a fractured cap rock for CO2 disposal. Uh, I actually used a fracture model, which uh, is used uh, by, by you know, multiple researchers. Um, you know, the last ones were Hu and Marcus Tifel, which is this fracture model. Uh, and I used uh, the DFM model, which is shown here, and EDFM model, which is shown here. Uh, and for the DFM model, I used the triangle program to discretize the domain. And uh, for this one, the HFM module is used. All right, so uh, I considered uh, the Mount Simon aquifer, actually the cap rock of the aquifer, which is uh, the Oakler formation uh, to do the modeling. I used the properties and uh, the rock and fluid properties of that. I use I considered these chemical reactions and um, the, the initial pressure is 20, uh, 2400 PSIA uh, and water is injected uh, from uh, the leftmost grid blocks with a constant flow rate and produced from the rightmost grid blocks with a constant pressure um, and constant pressure of 2400. We uh, consider different scenarios, uh, which um, uh, table of which is shown here. Different compositions for the injected water is considered. Dif uh, different injection flow rates, different fracture apertures are considered to investigate their effect. All right, so here uh, you see an example. You know, one of the scenarios, uh, actually a scenario this three, which is the name of the scenario. Um, you know, after 50 days of injection, uh, the distributions of uh, different chemical species are shown here. This is, as you see, um, uh, you know, hydrogen concentration has uh, increased in this part. And as you see, the solution of dolomite has occurred. Why I consider dolomite? Because uh, the formation, the ochlear formation is mainly made of dolomite. Uh, so I consume, I assume that uh, actually, um, you know, the formation is solely made of dolomite. So when uh, the solution of dolomite occurs, calcium, magnesium, and uh, bicarbonate are produced. And as you see, the concentration of them have increased. Uh, and also when um, the concentration of bicarbonate increases, uh, based on uh, the Le Chatelier's principle, uh, the concentration of car uh, carbonate increases as well. But as you see, this increase is not very visible. But when we uh, plot uh, the effluent concentrations, uh, we can see there is a little bit increase here, uh, which can uh, you know be seen in this plot. Uh, but you know this decrease is actually because of the very low um, you know concentration of um, carbonate in the injection injected water actually. All right. So we investigated the effect of different um, you know compositions for the injected water. Uh, in this two case. Uh, the difference is that um, actually the composition of the two injection waters is different in terms of calcium, magnesium, and bicarbonate ions. And as you see, there's not much difference. So it shows that the concentrations of these chemical species uh, don't affect the, uh, you know, the solution pattern very much. But when I change the pH or the concentration of hydrogen, as you see, uh, actually, uh, you know how it has changed. In this case, the pH is four. In this case, or this case, the pH is three. And because the pH has uh, increased or has gotten more basic, 
um, you know, very little uh, dissolution has occurred just in the vicinity of the inlet. All right. We also compared the effect of different injection flow rates uh, in order to investigate uh, different um, you know, dissolution patterns. In this case, we have the lowest injection rate, and in this case, the highest injection rate. And as you see, as the injection rate is higher, um, you know, the injected water has more time to flow into the reservoir be, um, you know, before it becomes fully buffered, all right? Before all the hydrogen becomes consumed, it you know goes forward, it moves forward and dissolves even um, you know in the fractures and the surrounding grid blocks. And this is just um, a different visualization of the results. We also compared the effect of uh, different fracture apertures. Let me make sure that my internet has not disconnected. All right. Uh, so we also compared the effect of uh, different fracture apertures. Um, in this case, the fracture aperture uh, is uh, one millimeter. This case is fracture aperture is uh, 0 0.01 uh, millimeters. And as you see, in this case, because of the higher, um, you know, larger fracture aperture, more dissolution has occurred, um, for example, in this fracture, uh, you know, than this fracture. But as you see in this case, which has a larger fracture aperture, less dissolution has occurred uh, in this fracture than this fracture, which is actually because of the fact that, um, you know, when fracture aperture is, is a smaller, which is this case, fluid velocity is higher. And so uh, when, you know, uh, because it is has it has a higher uh, velocity, uh, it moves much faster forward before uh, the injected fluid becomes buffered. And so uh, that's why, um, you know, more dissolution has occurred here. But as you see, um, you know, there is a, uh, actually a little bit difference between the two cases. Uh, and in the case that uh, has larger fractures, larger aperture fractures, um, or fracture apertures, um, a little bit more dissolution has occurred, but uh, maybe I could say that the difference is quite negligible. All right, I also used the EDFM um, you know, model to model the fractures, and in order to uh, compare the results of the two models together, and as you see, uh, I used the actually uh, only the scenario this one to compare the results and this is um, you know the, the output of the simulation uh, by the EDFM model this is the hydrogen concentration because in this case this one um, the injection rate is very low the solution has occurred um, just in the vicinity of the inlet and it has not reached and um, you know the fractures at all and that's it and this is just a comparison of uh, the e EDFM and DFM models. Uh, and as you see, the results are quite similar. I also compared uh, the geochemistry module and Pentreact modules together. And the geochemistry module uses actually an element based approach, and uh, it only accounts for equilibrium reactions. Uh, so uh, the fact is that when we when uh, we consider all reactions as equilibrium reactions, um, you know the calculations may become a little bit inaccurate. So I uh, actually um, improved the geochemistry module by using the approach by Fan et al. Fan Darlovsky Chelepi in this paper uh, to um, you know make the module account for both kinetic and equilibrium reactions. So I did this and then I compared the results, uh, actually the computational performance of the two models. Uh, when I used the geochemistry module, which has uh, an element-based approach, um, I uh, was able to um, you know, model such a you know, domain with this discretization um, uh, with a supercomputer. And I couldn't uh, use uh, just a, a little finer mesh than this using a supercomputer with 128 gigabytes of RAM. Why? Because the uh, geochemistry module in terms of memory is very, very computationally uh, intensive. But uh, when it comes to uh, the sequential approach, uh, which is applied to uh, actually the Pentreact module, um, I managed to um, you know, model the finest mesh that the triangle code could create. 
in order to um, actually discretize the domain. And as you see, I managed to um, actually um, you know, model this with 13,229 cells uh, with my own personal computer with only four gigabytes of RAM, which actually an advantage of uh, the sequential approach. But actually, uh, the, geochem uh, the geochemistry uh, you know, module has uh, a good advantage. The advantage is that uh, it is more stable, you know, computationally stable. All right, um, let's talk about my future work. Uh, I'm going to also, uh, you know, apply multi-phase fluid flow modeling to this, um, you know, module because it only considers single-phase fluid flow, and I'm also going to incorporate mechanics into the model and. Um, I also going to um, you know, use the global implicit approach to model reactive transport modeling. The approach that I used is sequential approach, um, and I'm going to use this approach uh, you know, later on. All right, thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you for following me, and thank you for your attention. I'm ready if you have any questions.